Well, thank you, Marina. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here delivering this uh, webinar today on the 2019 Nonprofit Sector uh, Salary and Benefits Survey. Um, over, the next, over the course of the next 45 minutes or so, uh, we're going to tell you a little bit about the Portage Group, give you an overview of the study and who participated, uh, review some high-level compensation findings, provide some insights into how to use the data, and we'll wrap up with a discussion on using the compensation data to make the case. And as Marina uh, said, there will be a question and answer at the end. Um, and we will get to as many questions as possible. So free, free, feel free to uh, put those questions in the uh, comments box. Um, in terms of the questions we'll be answering today, we will be focusing only on those uh, specific to uh, the study in general or about how to use the data. Anything on specific results or um, things in the appendix or things like that, uh, if you put them in, we'll try to answer them after the uh, webinar. So a bit about uh, the Portage Group. Uh, we are a full-service management consulting group focused on the distinct needs of the not-for-profit sector. Uh, combined, our team of experts uh, has served over 300 associations, regulators, and charities in the areas of uh, research, strategic planning, governance, executive recruiting, and organizational design. Our research team has conducted over 200 projects uh, including approximately 30 compensation studies for organizations such as Charity Village, the Canadian Society of Association Executives, uh, the Philanthropic Foundations of Canada, Ontario Not-for-Profit Housing Association, and many others. My name is uh, Jeff Thacker. I am an executive partner with the Portage Group. Uh, my responsibility is in the area of research and strategy, and I'm one of its founding partners. I've been conducting research for almost 25 years, uh, leading all kinds of projects, and in the last 16 years, I've focused almost exclusively on associations and other nonprofits. Um, as mentioned, I've conducted uh, over 200 uh, research projects, including 30 compensation studies, which includes all five of Charity Village's studies. And prior to working in the sector, I spent uh, seven years uh, at PricewaterhouseCoopers, where I played a lead role in their measurement market research practice. Uh, over to you, Jack. Thank you, Jeff, and hello, everyone. It's uh, Jack Shand. I'm also delighted to be part of today's webinar with Charity Village. Uh, my background, uh, similar to Jeff, uh, have uh, been very proud to be part of the Portage Group since uh, 2015. My consulting experience uh, spans over 15 years with a number of different firms. I'm a fellow of the management consulting profession here in Canada. Uh, as noted, uh, our focus has been on all manner of nonprofits, so I've been privileged to work with associations, charities, uh, regulatory organizations, unions, and others. Uh, prior to my experience as a consultant, I was the chief executive officer of three national associations, uh, including the Canadian Society of Association Executives, where I was president for 10 years. And for those of you joining us who perhaps have volunteer roles in your organizations, I can certainly relate to your work, having held different volunteer responsibilities over the years, including uh, with a university business school, uh, a prominent national health charity where I was a director and fundraising chair, and I continue to be active in, at a community level uh, with, uh, with an organization as a board member. Jeff, I'll turn it now back to you. All right, thanks, Jack. Um, <clears throat> so before we get into some of the results, I'll just provide a bit of a background on the study. Uh, data was collected through various uh, channels uh, in November and December of 2018, so it's new data. Uh, and in all, uh, almost 1,600 organizations participated in the study. Um, this represents... Sorry, this represents an impressive 56% uh, increase over uh, 2017 participation. And each survey allowed respondents to provide information on compensation benefits for an unlimited number of uh, staff members grouped into uh, six staff levels. In all, there were uh, over 4,500 positions reported. And in some instances, uh, 
respondents reported information on groups of staff in a particular position. So in total, the study represents uh, 12,326 individual staff in the sector. Uh, the, <clears throat> today's webinar focused primarily on the compensation aspect of the study. However, it's important to note that the study also covers the type and value of employment benefits offered in the sector. Some uh, things to keep in mind uh, when you are looking at the report or throughout this presentation. Uh, compensation figures are as of December 8, 2018. Results are based on the survey response respondents and it's only as accurate as the responses they provided. Uh, the survey was conducted using Charity Village's uh, subscriber list, or their webinar list, uh, as well as social media recruitment, and it's not a random sample. Um, because it's not random, the results may or may not be accurate, uh, or accurate representation of the total nonprofit sector in Canada, um, and accordingly, they reflect only the views of those who participated in the survey. Additionally, professional and trade associations and foundations were generally not included in the study so as not to skew the data. There are other sources of uh, compensation information for those types of uh, organizations. And while the results, the overall results are very robust, uh, some of the uh, detailed findings presented in the appendix and in some places throughout this presentation should be interpreted uh, with caution where the sample sizes are a little small. So who participated in the study? <clears throat> Just over half of participating organizations were headquartered in Ontario. Uh, BC and Alberta were also quite well re represented, um, and we did have some re uh, participation from the Prairies and Atlantic and Quebec. Two thirds were registered charities. Uh, significant 44% of respondents represent local organizations. National, provincial, and regional organizations each represent about 16 to 18 percent of respondents. And as you can see, we also had a good mix of organizations by size in terms of the number of staff and the budget. So, on to some uh, highlights of the results. Uh, while many components make up the overall compensation package, by far the most common benchmark is cash compensation. Unlike other components of compensation, the value of cash compensation is easy to compare from one employee to the next. Over the next few pages, I'm going to provide a high-level summary of cash compensation. Uh, more detail and specific benchmark comparisons are available uh, in the report. <clears throat> Here we have a summary of cash compensation by staff level. Uh, the blue bar represents the average base compensation across the entire sector while the small sliver of orange uh, represents the average bonus cash compensation. Uh, not surprisingly, cash compensation generally increases with seniority. The one exception is uh, level two senior executives where uh, the average compensation sector is actually a little higher than the average for CEOs. This is because while most organizations do have a chief executive, most are not large enough to also have a uh, senior executive position. Uh, subsequently, this position is more likely to exist in larger organizations where pay tends to be higher at all levels. Um, and it should be noted that in organizations where both those positions exist, the CEO is almost always uh, paid more than the uh, senior executive. Uh, as seen here, uh, CEOs in 2018 earned an average of $91,500, of which $90,100 was in the form of base compensation. As mentioned, level two senior executives are slightly higher at an average of $94,200, followed by level three senior management at $82,500. After that, there's a significant drop off to level four and the non-management uh, staff. As noted on the previous slide, uh, bonus cash compensation uh, does not represent a significant portion uh, of compensation sector-wide. Uh, in fact, only 9% of participating organizations reported offering an incentive plan to at least one staff level. Um, CEOs and level two senior executives 
are by far the most likely to receive bonus cash compensation uh, at uh, 13 and 14 percent respectively. Um, it drops off to 8 percent of level three senior management receiving uh, this type of compensation and then between four and five percent at the three lower levels. Across all CEOs, uh, including those that do not receive a bonus, um, the average value added to the incentive or to the compensation package uh, by bonus compensation is only 1.1% of base salary. And this is the amount that was presented on the previous page when we looked at total compensation. Um, but if we look at only those who receive uh, bonus compensation, those who receive it are actually being paid an average of 7.8% of cash compensation in the form of a bonus. So sector-wide, the total value is 1.1%, but for those who receive, it's 7.8%. Level two senior executives, the numbers are very similar to CEOs. Um, and then at the four lower levels, uh, the average bonus across the entire sector, so including those who don't receive it, it only adds uh, between 0.1 and 0.4% uh, to the value of the compensation package. And if we look at just at those, only those who receive it, it's 2.7% to 5% of, of base compensation. So we've been uh, doing this study, we've done five of them since uh, 2011 uh, for Charity Village, and there have, have been some changes in uh, compensation over that time. From 2016 to 2018, uh, the strongest growth in total cash compensation was among uh, the support staff levels, level six. Um, over the two year period, cash compensation grew by 9.8% for the two year period. Um, level three senior management at 2.7% and level five functional and program staff at 2% were the only other levels to see increases. Uh, compensation at level two was stagnant, while for CEOs and uh, management supervisory staff, uh, average compensation actually declined. Now, it's important to note that just because there's th uh, these changes at the sector level, it does not mean that individual staff are necessarily seeing those same uh, increases or decreases. As people move from one job to another, or as they leave or enter the sector, or positions are created or removed, the average pay of, of workers in the sector will shift. So for example, if you are a level three employee and you get promoted to a CEO position, you probably left the level three position at a high, high compensation for that level, but you enter at a low compensation for the CEO level. The net result is you actually bring the average down for both of those levels, even though you receive an increase in pay. So with that in mind, it's important to look at the overall uh, long-term picture, um, as that will smooth out the peaks and valleys that happen based, you know, based on who participates in the study. And on the whole, compensation in the sector uh, has been growing slowly over, over the seven-year period from uh, 2011 to 2018. Compensation uh, has grown at an average of 0.4% to 1.8% per year, depending on which level you're looking at. Not surprisingly, many organization characteristics and personal characteristics uh, will influence the level of compensation. Following are some examples, uh, starting with some organizational characteristics. Uh, region. Uh, the highest pay for four of six levels is found in the greater Toronto area. The two exceptions are management supervisory staff, which is level four, and support staff, which is level six, where Ottawa actually ranks first and the GTA ranks second. Higher budgets and larger staff sizes generally correlate to a higher compensation at the four management levels. Compensation at all levels generally increases with the size of community in which uh, employees are located. 
And for levels one, three, four, and five, cash compensation increases um, as the organizational jurisdiction broadens up to a level of national. So from local to national, it generally increases before dropping again for international organizations. And now we'll look at some of the personal characteristics. Age obviously often correlates to experience. Uh, therefore, it's not a surprise that age also has a strong correlation uh, with cash compensation. As age increases, so does compensation. Similarly, uh, experience, we actually looked at five different types of experience uh, in the survey. Those were uh, years in the position, years in the organization, years at the seniority level, uh, years in the discipline, and years in the not-for-profit sector. While all five of these uh, experience factors correlate with uh, compensation, the strongest relationship tends to be with years in the uh, current discipline. And finally, higher education generally correlates to higher compensation, particularly if the degree or diploma is relevant to, uh, to the current job. All right, so now let's look a little bit at how you can actually use this data to establish uh, a salary range. So the first step in determining proper benchmarks is to determine the applicable profile. So here we have, we have Susie Q. Uh, she is the CEO of a registered charity based out of Ottawa. Susie's three-year contract is up for renewal and she needs to gather information to help her and the board agree on a competitive compensation package going forward. Accordingly, she turns to the 2019 Canadian Nonprofit Sector Salary and Benefits Study to help, uh, help gather some benchmarks. As a first step, Susie creates a profile of her organization and herself. And in addition to the factors I just mentioned, uh, the charity is national in scope. It's modestly sized with seven staff and an annual budget of $1.2 million. And uh, the charity is not formally affiliated with any other organizations. Um, and Susie, she's the CEO, works full time. She's 56 years old and holds an MBA. So with her profile in hand, Susie turns to uh, page 67 of the report uh, to reference the detailed benchmarks for the CEO position in registered charities. Uh, Susie proceeds to identify all the benchmarks that match her profile. Uh, there's nine in all. And the, uh, the benchmarks on this page, they're all specific to the category registered charities. So this is registered charities based in Ottawa, registered charities that are national in scope, registered charities that have a budget of one to two million dollars. Susie also decides that she should probably look at uh, the regional benchmarks as region can have a, a significant impact on compensation. And on page 109, she finds the detailed table summarizing the benchmarks for the CEO position in Ottawa. Uh, again, she identifies the nine applicable benchmarks uh, for Ottawa. And like the previous slide, these are all benchmarks specific to Ottawa. So uh, nonprofits with a staff of six to 10 based in Ottawa. To make it a little easier to work with, Susie copies all the relevant data into an Excel worksheet. Um, as a starting point, she decides she's gonna focus on the total cash compensation, as she knows this is the ultimate benchmark um, she wants to end up at, um, regardless of what the structure of that compensation package looks like. Um, but before continuing on, she wants to make sure that uh, these benchmarks are all reasonable, uh, you know, based on her organization and her characteristics. So, to confirm uh, that the selected benchmarks are appropriate, uh, she references the quartile ranges, um, which there are, were quartile ranges for registered charities. They're on page 65 of the report. And there's uh, quartile ranges for COs uh, in the Ottawa market on page 108. So using the, when you're using the quartiles, it's 
the way they work is different organizations uh, fall into different classes when it comes to compensation. Uh, the class of an organization will depend on factors such as the profile of the charity, the constituents it serves, the type of work it does, the size of the organization, etc. And organizations can generally be uh, cat classified into four compensation groups um, or quartiles. Um, the quartile range, essentially, it divides people into equal groups, 25% in each one, based on uh, salary. Uh, these quartiles should be used as a basic guideline in deciding the caliber of employee you wish to attract and retain. Um, so if you want top-end talent, you should be in the quartile four. If you want average talent, uh, you know, you could be in quartile two or three. Um, so these, these quartiles can also be used uh, to determine if the selected benchmarks and the final result line up with expectations. So based on her knowledge of the organization uh, and her own profile and her current compensation, she, Susie identifies her organization is probably uh, above average in the world of nonprofits. Um, but it's not likely in the top quarter of nonprofits and definitely not in the 95th percentile. Um, in other words, Susie feels that her organization would best fit into quartile three. And in comparing the registered charity benchmarks she's, uh, she, she's selected, um, she notes that they all fall within that third quartile except for one. That one is uh, the national registered charities, um, but it is just slightly above that quartile. Um, so based on this assessment, she decides that yes, these, uh, these benchmarks are suitable for her analysis. She also does the same analysis for the Ottawa market. Again, looking at the third quartile and noting that all benchmarks for Ottawa, for Ottawa uh, fall within that third quartile. So again, she's comfortable that uh, her selected benchmarks are appropriate for her organization. Okay, so now that she's done the basic analysis, it's time to use the data to establish a compensation range. Um, so when setting a range, uh, it's important to note that there is no one correct approach. Uh, the data in the report, it's only a guideline uh, to point you in the right direction uh, and to make decisions based on supporting data. Uh, setting a range, it's part math, it's part judgment. Ultimately, you want to set a range that's competitive, en competitive enough to attract and retain quality staff. In cases where you have an incumbent, it will be important to keep in mind the cost to replace that staff person. And in deciding on the final benchmarks, uh, you should give you should give the greatest weight to the comparables that are of closest fit to your organization and your situation. With that in mind, uh, following our three possible approaches Susie uh, could rely on with, uh, to use the chosen benchmarks to come up with a range. Uh, the latter two are actually variations of the same, uh, same approach. So the first approach <clears throat> is very simple and straightforward. Uh, you identify the high and low value, uh, which in this case is national associate or national uh, registered charities, and the the uh, the average benchmark is 110 to 59, and at the low end is registered charities with a staff of six to ten, uh, and the low is 79 609. So together, uh, these would form your range, which rounded gives you a compensation range of 79,600 to 110,300. And the midpoint on of those would be 94,950. Now a slight variation to consider uh, on this option or for any of them is dropping the original high and the original low value and going with the second highest and second lowest similar to what you'd see in uh, in scoring for a judge sport like figure skating or gymnastics. Um, 
and what the purpose of that is to take out any skewing by those high and low results. So in a situation like Susie's, this could make sense as there's a large drop between the second lowest benchmark and the lowest. Um, the registered charity staff benchmark uh, doesn't really fit with all the rest. So if Susie takes this approach, the new range would become uh, 88,800, which is from registered charities uh, that, are, that are standalone in terms of their affiliation status, to a high of 109,800, which is uh, Ottawa full-time be uh, benchmark. And the midpoint of those would be 99,300. Now, if you are going to take that approach where you drop the low number, you must also drop the high number. It's not an either or. The second common approach is to take an average of all your benchmarks and this, to establish the midpoint, and then you set a range based on a, uh, on a percentage variation from that midpoint. So let's assume uh, that the variation should be uh, plus or minus 10% from the midpoint. We start by calculating the average uh, across all benchmarks, which is 99,000. 396, which will round to 99,400. So that becomes our midpoint. And next we'll calculate the variance, which is 10% of 99,400. And 10% of that is 9,940. And to get the range, we simply add the variance to the midpoint to get the upper limit of 109,000. Uh, 340, and we subtract it from the midpoint to get the lower limit of 89,460. You may note that the, um, the final range and midpoints are actually quite similar uh, to what we saw using the previous approach after we had taken the high and low out. Um, this will not be, always be the case, but it is nice when the two approaches line up. Now, we could also remove the high and low values from this example. Um, but they don't actually make that much of a difference. The difference in the midpoint between keeping those values and removing them is the difference is less than $1,000. The third and final approach is uh, similar to the second approach. The key difference is that instead of taking the average of all benchmarks, we take the average of the major categories and then the range, and, and then we set the midpoint based on an average of those category averages. So again, we're going to assume we want a variance of 10% for the range and calculate the average for uh, registered charities, which is 93,975. And we also calculate the average for Ottawa, which comes out to 104,816. <clears throat> and if we uh, take the average of those two numbers, we get a midpoint of 99,396, which is exactly the same as what we had on the previous uh, approach. And the reason for that is because we have the same number of benchmarks in registered charities. We have six, and as we do in Ottawa, which is also six. So for that reason, we end up with the same numbers and the same results. However, if we had four benchmarks in one and six benchmarks in the other, you would have gotten a different result using, uh, using this approach. And this is actually the approach that we typically use when we do a custom analysis. And the reason is that it allows you to give more weight to uh, factors that perhaps should, should have, uh, play a bigger role in a particular situation. Uh, the ranges presented would be your published ranges. Uh, typically, an organization will hire qualified staff toward the midpoint of this range. Uh, the highest point in the range would potentially be earned by staff that are very senior in that position or whose performance is consistently well above average. Um, and within that range, so Susie would take this range and she would take her personal benchmarks, which was for age and education, and she would use those benchmarks to determine where in the range uh, she belongs. 
these numbers don't include the val the additional value for uh, benefits. Uh, on average, at the CEO level, uh, benefits can add up to uh, eight, or an average of eighty-two hundred dollars to the compensation package. So, using the report, you can um, determine what the value of the benefits should be, and then as a guideline, and then you can use uh, the popular what's popular in the report as a guide to what uh, benefits you should actually get for that value, or you can add that value to the total of the compensation package. There's lots of different benchmarks in the report to help you. Um, we also do custom runs where we go back to the raw data to provide more precise benchmarks if the information isn't in there. And with that, uh, I'll hand it over to Jack to tell you about making the case. Thank you, Jeff. All right, well, let's move to the next slide. I want to provide everyone with some context to the current job market and other trends, as those trends may influence worker supply and demand, as well as compensation overall. Ultimately, we are all competing for talent and or for opportunities to better our careers. This part of the webinar may help you secure a salary increase or help defend the magnitude of a proposed increase to the board. The business media has been focused on upbeat reports about low unemployment. The unemployment rate in Canada is currently at 6% or slightly lower, which actually is the lowest rate we've seen in over 40 years. This suggests that it may be a challenge to find good people for job opportunities, and that is pronounced in some sectors, such as in construction, where there is a shortage of skilled trades. But there are always exceptions. Ontario is the case in point where there is uncertainty about future government funding that touches certain employers, notably healthcare and social service agencies that rely on funding from government, or through agencies such as local health integrated networks. Larger organizations may also be subject to a salary freeze through the broader Public Se Sector Act and where their total funding from government exceeds $10 million. It is more challenging to secure higher compensation when funders are reviewing or changing their approach. Ontario is not alone with issues affecting potential compensation growth. Alberta has seen a decline from economic growth of 2.4% last year to predicted growth of 1.5% this year. With the upcoming provincial election in Alberta, there's always the prospect of political parties offering to stimulate the economy with a corresponding benefit to the job market or to the benefit of some charities. And of course, Alberta is not the only jurisdiction facing an election this year. In addition, federal, uh, we have it federally, uh, an election in Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, potentially even in BC, uh, given the status of the minority government. We also have heard that some prominent charities have been reducing management staff due to a reduction in corporate support. Whether these are coincidental one-offs or early signs of an economic downturn is unknown, but something we all want to monitor. The Portage Group's executive search work has seen for some time that the competition for quality jobs has never been greater. We believe this is occurring for a number of reasons, and this is not a complete list. First, top performers are incented to move on and or move up if their prospects in the current organization are flatlining. Moving up includes opportunities that may or may not exist with their present employer. With no opportunity for growth in career and in compensation, the employee who wants to advance professionally and economically is drawn to employers with a positive brand, a rewarding environment, and of course the opportunities that they seek. Second, for many employees in their 60s who are facing the traditional retirement date of 65, they choose to keep working. And as you know, for some, this decision is a financial necessity. For many, it's about keeping active and engaged in meaningful work. Third, the baby boomers are not the only ones looking to extend careers. We see people in the public and private sectors in their 50s who have their sights on second or third careers in the nonprofit sector. And in the case of public servants, may be able to retire from government at full pension, so compensation isn't their principal driver for the latter years of their careers with a charity, an association, or a regulator. We also see that people in the nonprofit sector with career experience predominantly in the nonprofit space 
are facing competition from candidates with multi-sectoral experience. That is to say, these candidates also bring a keen understanding of how government works and or how business works to their nonprofit job. It also means if all of your experience is in nonprofits, you may want to look for opportunities to learn more about public policy and or business. Jeff spoke to the movement reported in the Charity Village report for the past number of years. There is some additional information available on compensation trends that will help your organization settle on what increases to recommend or make as appropriate that can be defended based upon external data. Starting with the inflation rates in Canada, which is often a point of reference from December, the inflation rate was running around 2%, although in the past year it was as high as 3% last summer. For 2019, the consensus forecast is an annual inflation rate of 2.5%. Looking now to a number of consulting firms, uh, Mercer certainly uh, a well-known name. Uh, they reported increases in 2018 of 2.4% on average in non-union roles. Mercer is also forecasting 2.5% for 2019. And when I make reference to uh, different consulting firms and other sources, uh, their data, whether it be on actual results from 2018 or predictions for 2019, are based on surveys of employers which they conduct. The Conference Board of Canada projects increases this year from 2.2% to 2.9%, depending on the sector, with the private sector performing higher than the public sector. Anticipate that the non-profit sector will fall somewhere in the middle, although it may depend on who the organization represents. For example, an association representing business people may pay more in line with private sector increases than would a charity. A number of you will be familiar with Morneau Chappelle because they provide group insurance benefit programs to many, many organizations, including charities and membership-based groups. Morneau also has a range for 2019 from 1.7% in the healthcare sector to 3% among other professionals. From their employer survey of over 350 organizations, Morneau is forecasting average increases of 2.6% this year. There are other firms weighing in, and the forecasts are consistent with what I presented and the results that Jeff referenced in the Charity Village report. So if you are at or near the 2.5% increase level for 2019, there is plenty of information to defend that level of an increase. It may be helpful to note the results for the past couple of years. We talked about the trend lines in the charitable sector in Jeff's presentation. Aon, which of course is another well-known firm, uh, they, through their employer, employer survey, had an actual increase of 2.7% last year and a compass had actual results from the employers reporting through them of 2.6% going back to 2017. Moving to our next slide, a brief but important mention with credit again to Mercer. As we look at why employers elect to increase staff compensation, what's their rationale to pay more? Retaining your people is number one. No surprises here given the costs to recruit and the overall competitiveness in the market that I noted a few minutes ago. Second is to reward performance, or at least to make that link for employees that there is a positive quid pro quo for meeting the expectations and deliverables set by the employer. An observation, and this is the first tip, uh, what I'm calling an observation from over 25 years of experience in the sector. We know decision makers value data that supports knowledge-based decision making. Data points, as you saw from Jeff's overview, include organization size and scope, location, and other criteria contained in the Charity Village report. However, also be mindful the makeup of your board of directors may also be a key factor influencing compensation practices. There is a reason why some nonprofit CEOs or executive directors earn two, three, or four times even more of the average. It's because compensation at that level is viewed as reasonable value by the board of directors, and those directors may well be senior corporate leaders who themselves are earning very high compensation comparatively in the private sector. Demonstrating measurable results that deliver value to the member or the funder is also a very important factor. As we make the case for a salary or compensation increase, particularly an increase that is above the conservative 2 to 3% range reported earlier, it's imperative to have metrics 
that show how individual performance has bettered the organization. It could be a government decision that saves a company millions of dollars because of advocacy by an association, or positive awareness and brand visibility because of a creative approach that you took to sponsor recognition. So let's now turn our attention to making the case for an increase. You have the Charity Village report. What else will advance your prospects with the board or another decision maker who sets compensation? Some fundamentals. First, you have to set and measure expectations. Many of you have a solid performance management system, but it's surprising how many nonprofit organizations do not. Goals or targets are not set for the employee, and simple performance reviews are not con conducted. It is absolutely imperative if, you, imperative if you're not currently uh, doing a performance management approach. Uh, strongly recommend that that be on your to-do list to explore and institute in 2019. Second, you need to gather the information and then create a plan to make the case. There are other reports to complement the robust information in the Charity Village report. There is research published where sectoral differences may not play a significant difference for the position, such as an administrative or a finance position. The Toronto Board of Trade is a case in point. Firms such as Mercer and Hay Canada also publish compensation data. You might do custom research among like organizations in the sector. For example, if you're a national health charity in Ottawa, what do 10 other national health charities in the national capital region pay for similar positions? With the evidence in hand, now demonstrate how performance has quantifiably added value. What specific attributable results have surpassed the core expectations for the position as outlined in the job description and or the business plan? Years ago, an executive in the hospitality industry told me that the biggest challenge in resolving a customer's complaint is the customer won't say what will make it right. Our takeaway is be clear what you want. You can also monitor your value in the marketplace by looking at posted salaries on the Charity Village job board and other sites where salary is included with the job posting. Do be careful. No matter how difficult it may be to secure the increase you want, to not go negative. Focus on the data. Let's also acknowledge that the board has a responsibility as stewards of the organization to be fair and to be prudent. The board's duty of care includes financial management. It is said a board's most important job is picking their CEO, which means ensuring quality management to realize the organization's mandate. The board does not want to keep losing top performers, but the board must also resist placing the organization in financial peril by spending money it doesn't have. Boards and senior management, unfortunately, have seen it easier cutting costs than finding new revenue. The board or senior management is also thinking about what's fair internally based on how other employees are compensated. Internal equity could well extend to a board's legal responsibilities in areas such as pay equity. I had made the point earlier that compensation could be influenced by what directors earn. Compensation certainly can be influenced by the trends in your community. The board will be thinking of optics and possibly pushback from stakeholders. If the space in which you operate is facing economic pressures, think of Oshawa and the General Motors plant, for example, salary increases for staff that are perceived as too generous can be problematic and the board may well say no. There are external relationships the board must consider, particularly to public funders who want monies uh, put to use advancing the mission and uh, achieving agreed outcomes. I encourage you to reward people doing their jobs and doing them well, but don't forget that funders are usually on board because of those you are serving, not because of those you are employing. Moving to our next slide, let's stay with the theme of board considerations, and in this case, when they'll want to seriously entertain an increase. Where you can demonstrate these factors are present, it can bolster your case. Your work or your team's work may have reduced agency costs. Think of a more efficient system that may have been introduced where costs were lowered. For example, I know of a major food bank where the HR manager determined it could save many thousands of dollars switching group insurance providers without reducing the coverage that employees received. Avoiding costs is another angle. 
to helping save money, a smaller office space and corresponding lease cost with staff able to work from home, or outsourcing to part-time contractors rather than hiring more full-time st full staff could, could both be examples. Building up an existing program, attracting more support, or introducing a revenue stream that did not exist are also winners. There are many examples from the past, such as training courses in first aid that Red Cross or St. John Ambulance or others may provide, programs such as home renovations for seniors through agencies like Habitat for Humanity or community-based social service agencies. Revenue diversification and growth have likely been a major focus for your organization with some real successes, so point those out. Even if the organization does not pay thousands of dollars to a recruiter, there are costs to advertise the job, there are costs to hold interviews, to buy published research on compensation, and there are definitely costs when the organization realizes that not paying competitively will not attract the skills the organization requires because the salary will now have to be adjusted up. The hiring process can last weeks or even months, and a vacant position means work isn't getting done and or other people are burdened with a heavier load, all of which can affect morale and all of which can further challenges around staff retention. To another observation, one that may help especially if you're new to an executive director or board facing position. I think there's good reason why in the United States an improved increase to the president's compensation applies to the next president, not the incumbent. I recommend you find a respected person on your board of directors to be your advocate in securing support for change. You can provide that person with all the evidence, answer their questions, use tools such as exit interviews with departing employees to show that compensation might be the reason for high turnover. For some employees, the organization simply can do no more and offer no more. The following may be factors to help you assess if your best path forward is an exit strategy to greener pastures. Organization scope and size influences the magnitude of compensation, especially in senior management, as Jeff pointed out. Uh, running the Canadian Red Cross nationally is more complex than being the executive director of the South Chilliwack Poodle Breeders Club. Your market competitiveness and what makes you attractive to an employer is based more on what you've achieved than the functions you perform, such as organizing events or entering a financial transaction. If you are in a holding pattern where the learning opportunities have ended and you only see routine ahead, look to environments where you will grow and be challenged. You each have a network through past and current workplaces, friends, family, and neighbors, and via social media who can help identify job opportunities. Mobilize them to help in your job search. In my line of work, I also reach out to people, not so much because they are candidates for a potential opportunity, but because they are connected. Take those calls, be a friend of recruiters. It may pay real dividends in the future, if only the appreciative colleague who thanks you for helping introduce them to their next great opportunity. Charity Village has a job board you're all no doubt familiar with. Monitor it, watch for alerts, use other sites such as LinkedIn. Some employers include compensation information with their postings so you can track what's being paid by like organizations in real time. Facing and mastering a new challenge in a new environment broadens your experience and keeps your skills nimble. It can be broadening in other ways, for example, not restricting your career to organizations at just the local or regional level or to charities that only focus on health or community services. Every nonprofit in existence shares similar core activities, such as being an advocate, and those skills are transferable across the sector and beyond. Finally, another employer may have benefits that matter to you even more than salary. Is the workplace closer to home, reducing your commute? Uh, we have clients that offer their staff transit passes which is a nice segue to my final slide. Employers are creatively looking to providing employees with job benefits, and if these are not present in your workplace, you may want to investigate one or two, or you may even want to put them on a wish list for your next job. Several of these are known to you, such as increased vacation or training support, 
uh, I noted earlier work from home. One of our clients, uh, as I noted, provides transit passes. Others uh, have a very robust professional development and education program. Consulting is an interesting one that we encounter. Recently, I had a senior IT person who had left the charitable sector to go work for an insurance company who was recruited back by another charity because they were open to him earning income as a consultant through evening and weekend work. Uh, of course, uh, they had a condition. It could not compete with his work or the charity's interests. Other workers, in lieu of extra vacation, may be provided with a week or two per year to do consulting work, and possibly that may be internationally. Not all of these benef benefits uh, bring a cost to the employer. Training could include an active job shadowing or internal mentoring program to help employees be exposed to other areas in their organization. And that, of course, could also support any succession planning that you're planning to do. I'll end here so we have time uh, for your questions. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you heard a couple of ideas to help in your own situation. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Jeff and Jack. Uh, great presentation. Lots of good info there. I want to jump right in with questions because I know that we're short on time. Um, so, Jeff, we've got some questions about the survey methodology that I'd love to go over um, and what's included in the report. So, first of all, um, can you verify in the report, are there ranges of salary available or is it pretty much are just... Are there any uh, questions, Marina? So I'm just looking here. It looks like we have a couple questions from the audience. Um, and one of them that's just appearing at the moment is showing, um, will the guide be able to assist in determining a salary benchmark for a position that wears more than one hat, such as EA, office manager, finance, HR? So I don't know if that's one that um, Jack or Jeff want to shout out to. Well, I'll give my two cents and then Jack can fill in uh, from his recruiting side. Um, generally, the report, th the main focus is at a level rather than a specific position. So there are specific position benchmarks in, um, in the final appendix of the report. Um, so if you are uh, assuming all those positions wearing multiple hats are at the same level, then yes, you, you can use the uh, level specific data to determine what um, to determine an appropriate uh, salary range. I'll just reinforce uh, what Jeff has pointed out. I think uh, for many of you, uh, particularly the nature of charitable organizations uh, where people have very diverse job descriptions and uh, are doing many different things. I was just with a client yesterday where their finance person also is responsible for IT. Uh, so uh, looking at the uh, corresponding level of responsibility, the level of management that is represented in the report, and there are definitions, I think that will provide you with some really good uh, guidance based on uh, all of the different functions that fall in your area of responsibility. Great, thank you guys. Um, we also have another question here, um, just pulling it up again, there's a few questions. Um, one talks about how does the pay equity impact these salaries? Um. <laughs> Well, we do touch on um, the benchmarks between uh, gender, male and female, and uh, females have consistently sh had lower uh, compensation levels shown as males. Um, and that's, that's not just in this uh, study, that is in other studies. Uh, we don't purport to uh, say whether those are reflective of what's actually happening if you have an equal job. That's one of the challenges with the study and one of the things that we did look at to um, see if uh, there really is a, um, a disparity is we looked at the characteristics of the employers where uh, males were working and where females were working and one of the things we did notice is that there is a higher propensity of males working in the larger organizations and the higher revenue organizations. They don't tend to work as much in the smaller ones. And that is one of the contributors to that, uh, that wage gap between males and females. 
Um, there's a lot more work that would need to be done to compare, um, you know, e equal organizations um, and equal jobs to actually determine if, it, you know, to what extent that gap is still persisting. Great, thank you so much. And I'm not sure if there's any additions <laughs> from Jack. Well, I think uh, as Jeff uh, noted when we started the presentation, uh, the one caveat is uh, we have to rely on the data that is provided by those who are participating. So by extension, uh, we have to hope that those organizations are um, following pay equity practices, uh, that they um, uh, are being consistent. And um, But having said that, there are certainly um, um, there's been a long history in the sector where evidence suggests that uh, women are not paid at the same level. That doesn't necessarily mean that pay equity is not being respected. It could be, as Jeff points out, uh, that um, there is a preponderance of women in certain types of organizations, sizes of organizations. Uh, I've observed, for example, um, you know, smaller smaller community-based organizations, whether they be chambers of commerce, uh, real estate boards, etc., um, uh, the majority are are led by women. Great, thank you so much. And just before we go, um, we have another one that just says, "As many non-for-profits are funded by governments to a, a large extent, how can non-for-profits work with government funders to increase their receptiveness to these studies' results when negotiating contracts?" I don't know if you have any advice on that one. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question, and uh, all the more so it's very timely, uh, given that I noted that in uh, certain jurisdictions we're either seeing uh, significant economic pressures, such as Alberta, uh, or we are uh, dealing with uh, governments where, from a policy perspective, uh, they are simply moving in a different direction, and uh, that's not by any stretch uh, to suggest a, a judgment on what those policy directions may be. It just introduce, introduces rather a level of uncertainty uh, as, um, as both the government and those who are the recipients of funding or the distributors of funding uh, determine what, uh, what in fact uh, will be the case. I would point out that uh, obviously each and every one of the organizations uh, uh, that you represent uh, are independent uh, nonprofits, and while you rely on public source funding, um, your board still uh, can rely on good data, uh, and through its ongoing communication, I think government very much values evidence-based information. If the organization is going to be put at a disadvantage in terms of it being able to carry out its mandate and have positive impact, on the community or those it exists to serve because compensation practices currently are not competitive, do not reflect market realities, then presenting that evidence to those who make decisions related to your funding uh, hopefully will begin to turn the tide. Great. Well, that looks like we've reached just on the hour. So I want to thank you both again, Jeff and Jack. This has been a great introduction to the report. I just want to remind everyone that we will follow up with you by email tomorrow with the webinar recording and the slide deck. There will also be a short survey that will take less than five minutes to fill out. So hope you can uh, complete that for us. And uh, you'll have an opportunity there to let us know if there are any topics you'd like to see covered in the future sessions. Uh, we'll also include a link where you can get more information about the 2019 Canadian Non-for-Profit Sector Survey and Benefits Report and also order if you feel inclined. So we hope you will join us on March 7th for the first webinar in our executive series where we'll be talking about how to simplify, simplify the year process. And I'll also include a link to that webinar and registration in the email we send with the recording. But again, I really want to thank everyone for joining us today. And I hope to see everyone again next week. So have a great day, everyone, and all the best.